Republic instead. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? The women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions. On January 6th of 2021, you had tens of thousands of people peacefully protesting. So, it's not a right-wing conspiracy theory. It's not QAnon. It's real. <laughs> My guest today on the enemies list is a guy I deeply admire. It is Ken Harbaugh. Ken is a veteran. Ken is a pilot. Ken is a guy who has been out there on the front lines um, leading uh, and talking to uh, America about the crucial role veterans can play in pushing back against domestic extremism. And folks, if you don't think domestic extremism is a rising tide of, of trouble in this country, uh, think again. Uh, Ken, great for you. To, great to see you today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, great to be with you, Rick. Thanks so much. So tell us a little bit about the, the, the project you, you're working on right now and, and give us a perspective on where you think our country stands in the in the political space, particularly with veterans in um, in the moment that we're in. Well, the moment we're in is is fraught. It's not great. The project that is uh, coming out on March 29th is a documentary film that mm -hmm. I uh, co-wrote and produced with Sebastian Younger called "Against All Enemies" about why veterans, my brothers and sisters in arms, are being drawn into these extremist organizations right. like the Proud Boys and mm -hmm. like the Oath Keepers. And we saw that on January 6th. I, I mean, I was I was struck looking at that footage at those tactical formations working sure. their way through the crowd. And I, I knew what I was looking at. And I guarantee you, every veteran. Sure knew what they were looking at. And it, it was terrifying. And the last three years have been a deep dive into that phenomenon, into what draws these veterans into these organizations and why it is so dangerous. Talk to us a little bit about what the film sees as you go into this rabbit hole uh, about what you discover. What is the appeal of these extremist groups that that are, you know, and obviously against all enemies is the, the bottom or the next half of that is foreign and domestic. Uh, what is it that draws these these mostly men, I presume, into these groups? What is the appeal? What is the psychological hook? Is it is it you know the desire to have a sort of comradeship again? Is it a is it is it political? Is it ideological? What, what where do you see it coming from? I mean, it's a it's a cascade of causes and and effects, but the initial draw for a lot of these vets, and we spoke with many of them who were deep in these organizations. Mm -hmm. We had incredible access to the Oath Keepers, to the Proud Boys. That initial decision is often made out of a a desire for belonging, a sense to, or a desire to regain that that sense of brotherhood. You leave the military, you take off that uniform, and in a lot of cases, people feel lost. They feel like right. that camaraderie and that sense of purpose that they had while in the military overnight goes away. And that mm -hmm. can be a, a very lonely feeling. And these organizations, they fill that void. That's not to say they're the only organizations that can do that. As a society, we have to do a much better job of providing right. alternatives. And there are some great examples out there. But the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters do a really good job of recreating that sense of com camaraderie and mission. The only problem is the mission is to undermine democracy. And and let's talk about that for a second because, and I'd put them in, I would put the uh, the Three Percenters in a very political window. I'd put the Oath Keepers in a very political window. I put the Proud Boys in a kind of more assholes and anarchists and you know they want to they want to cause trouble they want to break things they want to make loud noises but it feels like there's some intentionality to to break the u.s system on the part of the of the the, the three percenters and certainly of the oath keepers that these guys are they've convinced themselves that that anything they do is justified because they're going they're going to be the ones who save us from whatever you know demon is in their head you know, I think it bears mentioning that this phenomenon is not new. Right. And General McChrystal points this out mm -hmm. very eloquently in the film. We've seen this play out in other countries to terrifying effect, but we've also had our own historical 
analogs. You, you, you look throughout American history at the rise of extremist movements. We've always dealt with this. The problem in this era is that we are dealing with an extremist movement that has political cover. And you have to go back a long ways in American history to find an extremist movement that has the kind of political cover that the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters and the Oath Keepers have today. I mean, the yeah. Proud Boys, an organization recognized by Canada as a terrorist entity, was mm -hmm. name checked by the president. Yeah. And when you mix those two things, the will and the means and the political cover, it is a recipe for disaster. And you really have to go back to the KKK and the Deep South in the 20s mm -hmm. to find a mm -hmm. historical analog. And that did not go great. No. I and mean, we had Donald Trump, you know, talking about the Proud Boys, stand back and stand by. Um, we've had we've had a lot of these Republican candidates explicitly sort of um, start using the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters as, as essentially muscle at rallies and for security. And it it, it strikes me that that they believe i mean the, the 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 political people that are supporting them they seem to believe that there is a a virtue to these groups even though what they're doing is is affirmatively against the oath they swore when they when they entered military service that's one of the most frustrating things for me you have the provocateurs, the the yeah. Donald Trumps, the Josh Hawleys, the J.D. Vances, who from a safe distance are provoking these groups, are sending them into the barricades. Mm -hmm. And you're right. They affirmatively are violating every tenet of their oath of office to support and defend the Constitution. But a lot of them don't think that. And that, to me, is is the real tragedy. And Congressman Crow says this in the film. He was one of the members who was trapped in the House galley when they had evacuated everyone else right. as the protesters are trying to beat down the door and break through the glass. Mm -hmm. And and it occurs to him, even in that moment, how did uh, the people on the other side of that door, he knew there were veterans in the crowd, how did they swear the exact same oath I did? And why did they believe it so fully? And a large part of the reason is is the big lie. It's the avalanche right. of misinformation that is intentionally targeted at veterans because of how useful they are to this movement. And and that really is something that I think is is a pretty dark aspect of this is that they the the, the targeting of them on social media particularly, um, and and the the sort of trying to give them a sense of you know aggrievement and 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 anger, it really does strike me over and over again that we see these, these, you know, people who were not veterans using, uh, leveraging veterans for their purposes politically in this country. Um, and, and I think that is a really kind of scary, kind of scary outcome and, and, and kind of a, it's, it's a deeply cynical outcome. Yeah, it's deeply cynical. Uh, it is deeply manipulative. It is obviously deeply harmful to the veterans mm -hmm. involved. And it continues to this day. I think one of the most alarming uh, postscripts to the film is that membership in these organizations has increased. The number of organizations might be decreasing, but that's because they're consolidating. Even in the wake of all the J6 prosecutions so scary. and convictions, this movement looks at January 6th as a massive success. It was a huge recruiting tool. It showed what a, a small group of, of committed insurrectionists can achieve. The people mm -hmm. who are being locked away are being now referred to as martyrs and hostages. Political prisoners. Political yeah. prisoners by potentially the next president of the United States. Right. And it is drawing more and more people into the movement. And, you know, that is, that is a terrifying proposition. You're saying these groups are are consolidating and they're sort of coming coming into a a larger movement. What do you think checks that? What is there I mean cuz a lot of people who listen to this show are looking for ways to I mean everyone acknowledges the crisis we're in, but f folks ask me this all the time and it is it's like what can we do to stop this? How do we reach out to these people? How do you reach out to these veterans and say, "Hey, hold up this is you know this is the wrong path this is a uh you're 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 breaking the promise you made to this country and to, and to its people and, and you're and you're hurting yourself in the end 
I think you're act- asking exactly the right question. And the film is an appeal to veterans and to people who care about veterans to to intervene, to speak up when you see one of your brothers or sisters being drawn into this vortex and say, this isn't right. This violates everything you swore to uphold and and defend. And it's not honestly going to be sitting through a film that changes your right. worldview. It's going to be at the dinner table. It's going to be over the holidays at Thanksgiving, talking mm-hmm. to people who care about you, who love you, who say what you believe isn't actually true. What you're doing is is harmful to the country. It's not helping. And in my experience, it's only those intimate one-on-one conversations that actually pull people back from the brink. I think that's true. I mean, I think that's true very broadly about folks who get caught up in the sort of conspiracy world and the, and the, I saw on Facebook that, you know, you're George Soros eats live babies or whatever the crazy, you know, thing is. I don't, you know, I'm asked all the time, like, how are you going to persuade the red hat guy? I'm like, generally speaking, I'm not gonna, it's going to have, it's going to have to be his wife or his son or his daughter or his mom or somebody or a good friend who says, Hey, come on, man, step back, step back from the brink. Um, what are the, some of the objectives of these groups? I mean, not just their stated objectives, which are sort of you know amorphous. What do you think? What do you think uh, the Oath Keepers and and these guys are are after at this point? That's a it's a great question. I think some of them are are social organizations. When you when you go into the Proud Boys and you see how much they do around you know barbecues and social events, a lot right. of it is just you know, a a way to recreate that sense of camaraderie. But the political element is where the threat comes in. And Mm -hmm. when you see these guys, you're right, it's mostly guys talking about the Turner Diaries at their events. You get a sense for, to answer your question, their Mm -hmm. objectives, which is to dismantle the existing system and replace it with something else. That something else is increasingly evocative of the, the white supremacist tropes of the the 60s and and later the 70s we right. we look at that historical parallel and there is a through line Kathleen Ballou who I believe mm-hmm. you've had on this show she's incredible mm-hmm. she literally wrote the book on what happens to this small percentage of veterans after uh, after combat the book right. is called bring the war home and she documents incredibly persuasively that in the aftermath of every foreign military misadventure this country has ever had, there is a spike in extremist activity in the U.S. Mm -hmm. The only thing Mm -hmm. we don't know, we know that phenomenon exists. What we don't know is how it plays out after the longest wars in America's history, Iraq and Afghanistan. And we can assume the answer is not great. I think think that, yes, there are longest wars, but there also are, are first wars that are truly um, mediated and, and retold by social media. And I think that gives, I think that is a way that, that some of these guys basically get targeted to be told, you know, you, you, you were, you're, you're, you're the victim now. And the only way to deal with this is not to seek redress or to change your life or to get help or anything, but the way to do it is to burn the system down. And, and that system again, as imperfect as it is, and we do a catastrophically terrible, embarrassing, not first world, just shameful job of helping our veterans in this country. We talk a lot about it. The system is still fundamentally broken on the VA side. Uh, you know, the, the, the helping veterans after, especially combat veterans after, deal with PTSD and deal with the, the, the mental burdens of combat. We are we are a global embarrassment at this at this stuff and i just i wonder how much that would help if they felt like they could talk to somebody if they felt like they could get help if they felt like they didn't have to go to you know run into the arms of these weirdos yeah i think that's a big part of it and i think your characterization of the the past the wars in iraq and afghanistan is spot on i would add especially in the case of afghanistan this sense of betrayal that a lot of veterans feel. Uh, And it's reminiscent of the Vietnam generation. You saw a massive Mm -hmm. surge in in membership in the KKK after Vietnam. And I think a lot of it was that impulse to 
to tear down the system to have uh, some kind of revenge after that feeling of betrayal. But to your point about creating systems and pathways for veterans to avoid being drawn into these organizations, yeah, we can absolutely do better. Um, my VA is great. I know a lot of vets who have a good experience at the VA, sure. but there are obviously gaps. And mm -hmm. where where some of those gaps aren't being filled quickly enough by the government, we need to look to private organizations. A great yes. one, and I'm a little biased here if people know my background, is Team Rubicon. There Team are Rubicon, other groups that stuff, yeah. do an incredible job at getting giving veterans that sense of purpose and camaraderie. Team Rubicon has trained over 100,000 vets to be disaster responders. Right. So they give them that sense of purpose, they give them that sense of camaraderie, and they channel it towards a mission that is actually helping Americans and not undermining democracy. We need more of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the most surprising thing you found out in making this film? The most surprising thing for me, and and it's it's tough to articulate in a way that uh, that that is like still true to the anger I feel about this overall subject mm -hmm. is the hum humanity of some of the, the actors. There's a, a character featured early. He's a leader in the Texas militia. Uh, okay. He believes firmly that Joe Biden stole the election, but you know, he's an, an incredible personality. He's charismatic. Mm -hmm. And if anything, the humanity of the foot soldiers of this movement made me even angrier at the Josh Hawleys of the world who know better and still send them to the barricades. That's really interesting. And I think that's something that, that I think you look at, you look at the guys like the Stuart Rhodes of the world yeah. um, who are, who are not dumb people. He's educated. He's not, the guy's not, the guy's not stupid. And I think that it is interesting that a lot of the people that are drawn into this, their their biggest personality comes out. Their be, their their best selves come out when they're in that environment of a of a team, when they're in that environment of a challenge, even if it's a misdirected and and screwed up challenge. Yeah. I had the most incredible exchange with Stuart Rhodes. We had amazing access into the Oath Keepers and mm -hmm. Stuart and I went back and forth over over text for a few weeks. It suddenly went dark and uh, turned on the news the next day and, and realized he had been rolled up. Um, but the other surprising thing to me was just how willing so many of the participants were to talk. And that was a signal to me that I they actually believed that they were on the right side of history. And that is a really tough thing to process. Oh, that's really someone interesting. Who, yeah, yeah. Um, they live in a different information universe. No, and mm -hmm. I, we have to understand that in order to counter it. Is it, is what, what social media hook are they really, is in their mouth right now? I know for some it's Facebook. I know for some it's Telegram, Discord channels. How are they, what, what is the recruiting method for a lot of these folks. Those are the big ones. I mm -hmm. think ultimately Trump is still a a singular figure. Sure. There's a ton of debate no about whether he is a symptom or the cause, but I think we saw this during the Republican presidential primary. There is no substitute for Donald Trump. No one else is going to charge the Capitol and right. try to hang a vice president. Uh, or I should say no other political leader is going to be able to right. motivate people to do that besides Donald Trump. He has a unique ability. And, you know, I've had really illuminating conversations with people who I think understand him better. His his niece, Mary Trump, Bandy Lee, who did the mm -hmm. psychological profile. I sure. mean, it is uh, a yep. I know both <laughs> a, almost a, a perfect storm of like psychological confluences that have created this person who is both charismatic and narcissistic and mm -hmm. cares nothing about other people. Um, and I, I don't think he can be replaced. So you do think that when Trump goes, whether it's the actuarial tables or gets defeated electorally, it's going to take some of the wind out of this movement. I think in the short term, yes, I think it will, it will flounder. 
But the other thing that the film points out, because it dives deep into into the history, is that there are historical undercurrents sure. that are even more powerful than than Trumpism. You talk about them often. The uh, the the specter of racism runs through this story, and the the reaction of MAGA to change and mm-hmm. trying to you know, stand, stand athwart history, right. Is a reaction to changing demographics and Mm -hmm. that exists separate of Trump. I, I had a conversation about a year and a half ago with a guy who was a former senior military official, JSOC type, you know, been around the, the block, wants to retire quietly. And, you know, but he pointed out to me, he said, my worry is not these 11 bravos who decide they want to go join the Proud Boys and, and act out. My worry is someday they're going to get five or six really tier one operators who are going to go put those skills to work and blow up a dam or a power plant or take an airline out of the sky as a, as a part of this. And, and I, that, I don't know if you touch on that in the film, but we've trained some very, we've trained some very able and scary people. Uh, are, do, uh, you, do you pick up a lot of those? Is, is there more or less draw for the elite types? Um, you know, again, the the, the operator types uh, into these movements, or is that a sort of you know fear we we don't need to worry as much about? Well, it, it's interesting, and we don't really dive into it in the film. But I've had a ton of conversations with my buddies about it, and mm-hmm. and one of the co-producers, a former Navy SEAL observed that the most dangerous veteran is the one who missed the war. And there's that feeling among Mm -hmm. these veterans that they didn't get their piece of the action and they're going to try to create that themselves somehow. Um, I think you're right about the, the operators, the, the soft guys, the tier one operators being a particular kind of threat. But one of the things we experienced, and and I see this over and over again, is that those who are actually in combat, who know what a civil mm-hmm. war looks like, have mm-hmm. no intent. No, to des- no desire to see that here. They don't want to see that here. The guys thumping their chests and talking mm-hmm. about the mm-hmm. next American civil war have no effing clue what they're talking right. about. That said, you know, we are getting past the the conflict years in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think there are some tier one operators who who um, yearn for that kind of conflict. I mean, we do show a scene in the film of a former Delta guy uh, on mm-hmm. Overwatch during a uh, one of the the protests and just waiting for them to to vandalize something so he can shoot a fellow American. It's one of the most terrifying scenes in the film. Stuart Rhodes is there. He's commanding that operation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're literally seconds away from former military personnel opening fire on American civilians on the streets of an American city. So that's entirely possible. It's, It's in the cards. But in general, I think most of the people you see strutting and strapping on body armor and right. talking about, you know, taking the fight to, to the libs have no idea what actual combat looks like. Right, right, right. Woo. Well, folks, um, the film is uh, against all enemies. Uh, I am looking forward to seeing it. I think that it is a, a really important story that, that Ken and his team have put together. Uh, it's an important issue for our country and the future of our democracy. And I look forward to seeing it. And Ken, let's get you back on the show again soon. Love talking to you, and uh, and uh, enjoyed our little our little war game a couple of weeks ago. That was exciting. <laughs> that was fun. And uh, I I couldn't quite convince President Trump to turn the keys, but here we are. <laughs> right. Um, well, uh, hopefully we can talk more about that. We've got more coming. Um, I think if if that tabletop exercise anticipating the worst case scenario taught us anything is that it's that we're not ready. <laughs> the other side right. is if there's a difference between just a petty bully and a fascist. It's that a fascist oh, yeah. has a plan and they have a plan this time. Mm, yeah, they do. They have a, they have a very thought out plan. Well, once again, Hey, Ken, tell people where they can reach you on social media. Uh, at uh, team Harbaugh on Twitter. You can learn more about the film at against all enemies, And we're, in limited theaters 
but on every streaming platform, March 29th. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. Appreciate Thanks, you coming brother. on. Great. Great to be here. <laughs> on today's enemies list, Dr. Joseph Latipo. Most of you are saying, who the hell is Dr. Joseph Latipo? Let me tell you who Dr. Joseph Latipo is. He is the Secretary of Health for the state of Florida, named by Ron DeSantis, but of course. Latipo is an infamous anti-vax activist, a crank, a kook, a loon bucket, a nut job, a wackadoodle, a madman. And right now there's a measles outbreak in South Florida um, because many parents aren't vaccinating their kids against measles. In part because Joe Flatipo and Ron DeSantis have spent the last several years telling parents, it's your right to decide if your child is vaccinated or not. Even though measles is making a comeback. Mumps is making a comeback. Polio is not going to be far behind. Vaccinations work. Kids should have them. The fact that they are, they believe this is somehow a matter of parental rights is leading now. And Latipo said, send your kids to school. It doesn't matter if they're infected. If these people end up convincing a meaningful fraction of Americans that you don't have to vaccinate your children, what we're going to get is dead kids. And I know I do a lot of anti-vax hate on the enemies list because I fucking hate anti-vaxxers. They are willing to have children die for a political illusion. So here's my, my, my declaration that Joseph Latipo is on the enemies. And by the way, he's paid over $400,000 by the state of Florida to go out there and advocate for policies that will cause the sickness and death of Floridian children at Ron DeSantis' orders. But he is on the enemies list big time this week. And I have really no mercy for these people who believe a charlatan like this. Um, and in fact, if I were governor, here's the deal. Yes, you have the right not to vaccinate your kids. But if they get sick from a disease that could have been prevented by vaccination, you're going to have them taken away from you. And if they get killed from a disease that could have been prevented by getting them a vaccination, you're going to catch a manslaughter charge. That's how I do it, but I'm sterner than most. Anyway, Joseph Latipo, top of the enemies list. Thanks.